from Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the show that delivers insights on federal government programs, people, and operations. I'm Mimi Gerges. As nearly 150,000 residents in Jackson, Mississippi are without water, the Environmental Protection Agency is implementing one of the largest investments ever in the country's water infrastructure. Janet McCabe is the Deputy Administrator of the agency. Janet, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Mimi. Let's start with that water situation in Jackson, Mississippi. What's going on now? How is the EPA involved? Yeah, um, I'm really glad people want to know about this. So as you said, 150,000 people live in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, there have been water issues there for a long time, and EPA has been involved with the city and with the state working to improve the situation there. Um, when the recent um, uh, storms, the storm happened and the, and the flooding, and the water system was just overwhelmed, um, EPA was able to take people to the site right away. Um, we have experts in these issues working with the city, with the state, uh, to fix, to bring water pressure back up as soon as possible. Water quality is also an issue there, but you just think about it for a minute. This is a, a, a sizable city, people without water in their taps, in their toilets, in their washing machines. Um, this is a very, very serious situation. So we will continue to be there just as long as we need to be in order to bring safe drinking water back to the city of Jackson. And I understand the EPA is also investigating how we got into this situation to begin with. The Office of the Inspector General, which is a separate agency within EPA, has started to, to look into it. So let's talk about the bipartisan infrastructure law. Yeah. How significant is this level of funding for oh my, the agency? Oh my gosh, this is an absolute game changer um, for everybody who lives in this country. If you think about the times through our history where we have invested substantially in infrastructure, think about building the canal system, thinking about building the railroad system, think about building the highway system. This is the kind of investment that this represents. In decades, there has not been this much invest investment. For EPA, and when I say for EPA, I mean for public health and for environmental protection across the country for millions and millions of Americans. This is an utter game changer when it comes to water um, quality, drinking water, safe drinking water, and disposal of wastewater, uh, cleanups of, of contaminated sites, a whole bunch of things. I'd be happy to go into whatever particular uh, app, uh, part of that you're interested in. I, I'm interested in water infrastructure because yeah. the, the bulk of the funding goes to that. Yes. Why, why, that, uh, why that sector specifically? Right. Well, first of all, our drinking water and wastewater systems are absolutely essential to public health and uh, the functioning of uh, uh, every place in this country, cities, suburbs, small towns, everywhere, right? We just, we can't manage without those things. Um, and it is expensive and it is old. So think about parts of the country where the drinking water system was built 100 years ago, right? Um, and uh, it is very hard to keep the investments going. It's expensive to do that. So EPA, even before the bipartisan infrastructure law, EPA was investing millions of dollars every year, sending it to cities, towns, sewer districts to uh, upgrade and repair and, and, and replace water systems. The bipartisan infrastructure law ups the ante on that, $50 billion to EPA to send out into the country. Um, this is massive, massive investment, and the need is tremendous all across the country. So this has been very exciting. I, I get that, that there is definitely a need. The infrastructure is very old. Will people actually see a difference? What what impact is this actually going to have on, on people's day to day? Well, one of the most dramatic differences it's going to make is we still have millions of, of water, drinking water lines in the country that use lead in the, in the pipes. And the older that gets, the more likely it is for lead to actually get into our drinking water. Now, you can't see lead in your drinking water, um, but you can see it when your children um, have elevated blood lead levels. This is one of the most um, well-known and well-studied childhood environmental risks. It can harm a child for life. And there's no reason in this country why any kid should have to drink water that has lead in it. So this money will move us toward President Biden's goal to have zero lead lines. Um, I would say that is one of the most dramatic and important impacts of this investment. Another $5 billion goes towards uh, cleaning up pollution. 
Right. What does that mean? Right. This is another super exciting part of the, of the law. So across the country, there are millions of sites that have been contaminated through prior pollution. So it could be something like your neighborhood gas station that isn't there anymore that had a leaking underground tank. It could be a dry cleaner. Those are some of the most common neighborhood. They're called brownfields. Um, but there are also just lots and lots of industrial sites that used chemicals where those chemicals are still in the ground. Um, then we also have the great big sites that are called Superfund sites, um, which if you think about Love Canal, um, that is uh, the epitome of a Superfund site. What the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law did was to give EPA $5 billion to, um, to put out into those communities to clean up those sites. And the exciting thing is that we know where a lot of those sites are. They've been studied already. The plans to clean them up are ready to go. They just need the money. And now, so we can put it out very, very fast and get that work done in communities right away. And if, I love this program, if you can't tell. Um, it, the return on investment when you clean up a site like that is $20 for every $1 invested. It improves local property values by 5 to 15%. It creates local jobs. This program has created hundreds of thousands of jobs across the country working locally in the community and teaching people skills. It's just, it's win, win, win all around. There's also money set aside to upgrade school buses. Yes. Why? Oh, because 25 million kids ride a school bus to school every day, and most of those school buses are dirty diesels that are pumping diesel particulate emissions into the neighborhood out of tailpipes that are right at stroller height right in our neighborhoods. And we don't need to use that technology anymore. We can use clean electric school buses that are quiet, that don't smell bad, that don't make a huge noise, and will improve the quality of life and health for people in our school communities and our neighborhoods. And $5 billion for EPA to, again, send out into the country to school districts who want to invest in this clean technology. And just as an example of how much people are eager for this, um, we, we have about a billion dollars a year. We put out a first announcement for $500 million of it. So um, uh, the first uh, uh, tenth of it, if I've got my math right, $500 million. We got requests from every state in the union for f up to $4 billion worth of school buses. So wow. the, the need and the desire is there. And we're, we'll, we'll be putting out um, uh, the results of that in, in a couple of weeks here. It's really exciting. And then we'll do other grant opportunities as the, um, the years go on. Janet, let's talk about the Inflation Reduction Act. It is, again, a large investment in climate change. Is this a game changer for the EPA? And how will you, um, how will you spend that money? And how do you prioritize? Yeah. Um, it is a game changer, not just for the EPA, but for America. Um, and um, I'll just talk about the EPA related parts of the bill, but of course there's many other things in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, uh, EPA gets about $40 billion with a B, um, again, to put into specific programs. So um, your question about how do we prioritize, well, the, the, the bill itself, the law itself, really tells us what to do with that. Uh, uh, a lot of it goes into clean energy programs that EPA already administers or, or, or is close to things that EPA administers. So uh, working with, um, with, uh, with communities, with state and local government, with companies to encourage and help support them moving to cleaner energy. So using energy that does not consume fossil fuels, which is what is contributing to climate change in such a, a, a major way. Um, the, the largest part of the funding, $27 billion, um, goes to um, what people are referring to as a, as a green bank or a greenhouse gas fund. Um, it's, a, it's a system so that money can be put out in, into, a, uh, into a fund that can, then can support, through loans or grants, lots of different clean energy projects, things that probably couldn't get funded otherwise. So think for a minute about community solar projects. You've got a, you've got a neighborhood, maybe it's a low income neighborhood, but it, because um, uh, of course it, it's, it's low income neighborhoods and disadvantaged communities that are impacted um, uh, more um, inequitably by pollution and by climate change. But it's hard to, for 
a, a community that's low income that may be rental housing, whatever, to invest in, in solar energy, which will bring energy costs down for that community and also help reduce the, um, the impacts of climate change. So the Green Fund will help churn money into the economy to do things like that. I, I want to uh, follow up on something that you alluded to just now, which is essentially environmental racism. And yes. I know that you're very passionate about that. Yes. First, define what that is. So um, over the years, as our society has developed and, and uh, the way we live in our world, which involves a lot of chemicals and the burning of fossil fuels, we know from study after study after study and data that EPA and others have collected that if you are a person of color, if you are a low income person, if you live in a rural community, you are more likely to be exposed to environmental toxins than if you are not. Um, one in four black Americans, black and brown Americans lives within three miles of a Superfund site. We were talking about Superfund sites before. These are some of the most polluted sites in, in our country. Um, if you are black or brown, you are more likely to live in a community that does not have as many trees. And so the air pollution is worse and the heat is worse. And heat is the number one cause of, of, of death from, from natural um, events, right? So these are very demonstrable health impacts that are inequitably shared. And I, I haven't even mentioned what we were talking about before, which is clean water and wastewater. Um, there are communities like the ones Administrator Regan has visited on his journey to justice, where people do not have sewer in their houses. The sewer sewage runs into the, into the streets. I visited villages in Alaska where they do not have running water in their communities. This is not right. So what's EPA doing to, to address this? Well, ever since uh, uh, President Biden took office and Administrator Regan came in, environmental justice and equity has been um, at the forefront of everything that we think about at EPA. And we have many opportunities to make sure that we are identifying and focusing on these communities. Uh, Administrator Regan has highlighted some of them through his Journey to Justice tours in the South, in Puerto Rico, in, in, in many communities around the country. But as we think about um, where do the grants go? Um, where does the enforcement and the com compliance work happen? Um, we, can, we have some discretion to focus on those areas where people have been unfairly burdened uh, and that needs to be addressed. I want to pivot a little bit to a major criticism of the EPA, which is that you create so many regulations um, that it hurts businesses. Mm -hmm. So how do you protect people, protect the environment, but at the right. same time not hurt their livelihoods? Right. Well, the, 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 I, the notion that a clean economy, a, a clean environment and a vibrant economy are opposed to one another or inconsistent is just absolutely incorrect. I mentioned the, uh, the number a minute ago about how investing in cleaning up communities brings more than $20 of, of good, environmental good and economic good for every dollar invested. Uh, we know our economy has grown Right, has demonstrably has grown over the last 50 years, and pollution has come down. Um, the other point that I want to make and make sure that people understand is that, um, that Congress, our U.S. Congress, has put in place laws to protect Americans from air pollution, water pollution, um, and, and land pollution. And EPA implements those laws. That, that is our job. So we, we don't pass regulations because we choose to do so. We pass regulations because the Clean Air Act requires that we do or the Clean Water Act requires that we do. And we do because our elected officials have decided that we want to have a clean environment in this country. Janet, you're a lifelong uh, civil servant. And I wonder what makes you so passionate about this type of work specifically? Yeah, it's, um, I, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that. I, um, you know, when I started out my career, I'm trained as a lawyer. Um, I, didn't, I didn't plan to go into environmental protection. I, I wanted to be a legal aid lawyer and represent poor people in, in legal matters. And I ended up getting a job doing environmental protection in, um, in Massachusetts. And that led me to a career in, in two states, being a civil servant in two states on environmental issues um, with, with little forays into um, uh, nonprofit work and, and a little bit of time um, at uh, uh, Indiana University where I live. Um, to me, there is no higher calling than public service. And uh, being in the environmental field has shown me 
how pervasive environmental risk is in our country and how fundamental it is to people's quality of life, people want to, what they want is to be able to bring up their kids in a safe neighborhood and know that when they turn on the tap, they don't have to wonder if there's something in their water that's gonna make them sick. They, they, they don't wanna have to keep their kids home from little league practice because it's an ozone action day. That's what we all want, right, is to know that our kids are safe. And we, we expect government to help us do that. And so it has been just the honor of a lifetime, a privilege for me to be able to work at all levels of government, help pr helping protect my home state, and, and now at the federal government where we can affect millions of people at one time. Um, it's just the greatest honor that I could ever imagine. Deputy Administrator, I appreciate you coming in. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.